Welcome to Tavana eLearning Institute for Iranian Civil Society. This is the first webinar uh, in a series of new tactics in human rights webinars, which the Center for New, Ta Net new Tactics in Human Rights at the Center for Victims of Torture will be facilitating. Uh, Nancy Pearson will be conducting all of these webinars. Um, there are a series of four in total. This is the first. She will be facilitating all of them. and. Um, She's a wonderful facilitator who's worked in repressive regime contexts with activists like yourselves uh, for many, many years, and I've been um, honored to know her and work with her for a number of years. Um, we'd like to together welcome you all to this uh, webinar and hope that you will um, help us to make this one and future webinars as good as possible by uh, giving us your candid feedback. There will be an evaluation at the end of uh, the webinar, um, which we hope that you will fill out and provide your um, honest feedback on. The, today's session is about prevention tactics. Other ones will follow um, in August and in September, so there will be three more. And you're all welcome to participate in those. Many people are registered. In fact, we're almost at full capacity for all of them. These webinars will be in English, but future webinars on um, many different subjects. Um, some of those will be in Persian or Farsi, and some will be in English. So without further ado, Nancy, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Miriam said they, this information will be available to you. And just uh, to take a note of under the Creative Commons copyright, please just attribute the information back to the New Tactics and Human Rights Project at the Center for Victims of Torture. Don't use the information for gaining any profit. Share it and share and share alike in terms of if you alter it or transform it or build upon this work, please uh, use the same copywriting and let us know so we can continue to share that. Um, today, I just wanted to give you a little picture of myself so you can see who I am. Uh, I am a, a, have a master's degree in social work and I'm a licensed independent social worker. And I have been working at the Center for Victims of Torture for over 11 years. Started by providing services uh, for torture treatment to our clients that come from over 60 countries around the world and have moved much more into that training capacity uh, with activists like yourself who are making change in your home countries. And I just want to give a little bit of an outline of what we will be doing today. First, we'll give just a little brief orientation to how to use the GoToWebinar tools. Then we'll move directly into the foundation for strategic thinking and tactical innovation that the New Tactics in Human Rights uses for uh, this process. Next, we'll identify and define some key terms so that you understand where we're coming from uh, in relation to strategy and tactics. And then we're going to take a little bit of time to discuss six reasons why there's a need for new tactics. And finally, we will get into exploring prevention tactics. And I do want to share that um, we will be taking a look at the New Tactics website throughout this process, uh, www.newtactics.org. And all of the information that I am sharing with you today, you can find there, and all of the resources are downloadable for free to you. We'll continue now with our Foundations for Strategic Thinking and Tactical Innovation. And wanting to have this uh, a bit of a, an opportunity to uh, be looking at these foundations. And the New Tactics in Human Rights Project takes this foundational thinking from Sun Tzu, who lived over 2,000 years ago, and wrote quite a, a well-known book called The Art of War. But one of the quotes that we like to use in terms of uh, illustrating strategy and tactics is this one. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And in this sense, really looking at uh, what might be uh, the aspect of if we're just thinking strategy, we might be planning and planning and talking around the table. But if we don't actually put a plan into action, which could be our tactics, then nothing is going to happen. However, on the other hand, if we just move forward with tactics, 
without having a strategy of where it is that we want to go, uh, we could likely not only uh, not sit, well, we very likely won't succeed, but we may very well in, endanger people. So tactics without strategy can actually be fatal for people. So it's important for us to think about that combination and integration of strategy and tactics. The other part that Sun Tzu told us about was that there are three very important sources of knowledge. And that is beginning with know yourself, know your opponent, and know the terrain. Now as we look at these three areas, tell me in the, in the chat box just what you think you need to know about yourself. What would be important for you to be able to know about yourself? And the things that we need to be knowing for ourselves really comes up to what, is, what are our goals? What is it that we want to be accomplishing? What problem might we be trying to solve? Who are our allies in being able to make this happen? What are our strengths and limits, including what resources do we have to bring to bear on the issue that we're working on? And finally, what tactics do we actually know and those that we can successfully implement to move those goals forward? In terms of the opponent, what do you think you might need to know about your opponent? Well, what we need to know about our opponent is pretty much what we need to know about ourselves. What are the goals of the opponent? What are the allies that the opponent has in which they are bringing to bear? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And what are the resources that, that they have that they are putting towards this effort? And a key thing that we can learn about what might be the opponent's strategy is through the tactics that they're using. And knowledge of these tactics can aid us in being able to counteract them. Now, as we move to the terrain, what is the terrain? And what do we need to know about it? Well, the terrain includes that context that we are living and working in, that social, political, cultural context. But more importantly, because of that context, it is the human relationships and the human institutions in which we are trying to make these changes. And so when we think about where the battle will be fought, it might not be on a particular geographical or land terrain. Instead, it is in the human relationships and institutions, and in terms of the, the laws and policies in which humans have created and whether or not they are carrying those forward or not. So we're trying to make those changes in the relationships within our societies. And as we look at our key terms, we're going to be taking a couple more polls. So what is strategy? Well, the correct answer on this is actually A. It defines what it is that is important to do. And as we come back to our slides, it is because it really outlines the key steps and approaches for accomplishing the goal. So the strategy defines what is important to do, including what are those key objectives that we need to define in order to reach our goal. Who might be the appropriate targets that we need to change? Understanding the needed constituencies, and constituencies meaning what groups or institutions or people need to be really um, understood in order to move our issue forward. And the resources, again, that we are going to bring to bear, what resources we use and when, and then decisions also on which tactics we are going to select to use and when we use those. So coming back to that, it's the strategy defines what is important to do. All right, we're going to have a poll on what is a tactic. So that poll will be launched. And please pick either A, a specific action taken to affect a given situation, or B, a source of inspiration, which focuses on the future. We have 71% of you that say a specific action taken to affect a given situation, and 29% of you selected a source of inspiration which focuses on the future. The correct answer in this particular poll is A, a specific action taken to affect a specific situation. Great. Now, as we think about this, now tactics are the levers or mechanisms 
to carry forward and to carry out our strategy. So a tactic is a specific action or a systematic combination of actions taken to affect a given situation. And it's important to note here that generally speaking, it takes more than one tactic in order to move our strategy forward. I mean, it's very rare you would see only one tactic being used in order to move a strategy forward. But that's that aspect of strategy building. What tactics do you use in combination with each other to move that forward? And that in that way, tactics are one of the key building blocks of our strategy. And so the tactics are about how we are taking that step-by-step -step process to move our strategies forward. And the strategy itself is about the what is important to do. Now, I want to just identify uh, an, another very key uh, term that we're going to be using, especially as we're looking at our tactics today. That when we use the term target, we are referring to the person, an institution, a group or a segment of society where your tactical action is directed. And I'm going to illustrate each of these aspects in terms of a person, an institution, or a group, segment of society. So we might think about our target as being a parliamentarian, or a journalist, a religious leader, a teacher, an employer. So if that is the person, the group or, I mean, the institution specific business. Now the group Muted. potentially be the lawmakers or bloggers who are looking at the media, women as a particular segment of our religious society, students or businessmen. So you can see the distinction and what tactics you use would be different depending upon whether you choose a person, an institution, or a group. So as we move forward, we're going to talk now about six reasons why we have a need for new tactics. And the reason that there's a quote around that new tactics is because you yourselves are the new in the tactics. That there are not all that many ranges of tactics. However, the variations upon those tactics, the way that they're applied within the context of a political, social, or cultural situation, are what make them new and different and where we can gain great ideas for how we might adapt those ideas into our own issue, into our own context or region of the world. So as we begin, the very first reason why it's important for us to think about new tactics is that what we know how to do influences what we think is possible to do that tactics really can help to determine our strategy. And I'm going to share an example of this in terms of the advent of mobile phones. Before we had mobile phones, there were many ways in which we communicated quite differently. But mobile phones allowed us to communicate much more directly and instantaneously. And this particular picture is from Amnesty International Netherlands, where they created an SMS alert network in order to engage youth in combating torture with text messaging. And as we think about this particular tactic, the target here is the youth. The second reason that we want to be looking at our tactics is that different tactics are effective against different targets. Now, the example I'm going to use here is related to uh, the Committee for the Administration of Justice in Northern Ireland. Now, they utilize the Committee Against Torture in the United Nations in order to leverage pressure against the United Kingdom government regarding detention practices in Northern Ireland. Now, this particular one in terms of that target having been both the, the Committee Against Torture but the ultimate target being the British government using that uh, possibility. But in a government that is not at all concerned with international opinion, this might not be the best tactic. As, as we move to the third reason, that different tactics appeal to different constituencies. A little bit different than targets in the sense that um, 
we're looking more at a broader target, coming back to that aspect of groups and groups of people. So in this example, coming from Poland, you'll see this picture of a, a soccer player, a soccer star, who was utilized to really begin to do public education around uh, racism in Poland. And that target about both towards the youth, but towards a wide range of people who are interested in, in football, I should have set it as a football for the Europeans and those of you in the rest of the world. It's only the United States that uses that term soccer. Um, that these personalities are, are really very highly utilized in order to be able to reach different kinds of groups of people. The fourth one is in terms of tactical flexibility. Now, we need to be flexible in our tactics because a tactic that we've used often will begin to lose its effectiveness. Um, for example, if we even come back to Amnesty International with their original letter writing campaigns, um, people were sending letters uh, to, to governments or different institutions in different countries to ask for the release of prisoners of conscience. After a while, the governments themselves began to have a pretty bureaucratic response. They would just send a letter in return that said we are looking into this case and that was it. Nothing else happened without additional ways in which to build um, a surprise and a different kind of response needed. Things can get trapped. And so the example I'm using here comes from Korea, the Korea Women's Workers Association United. And as you can see from this picture, that's kind of a standard tactic, right? A demonstration outside of an institution. And that, that's one piece of, of what they did. But in terms of them trying to catch media attention, they actually uh, used two additional kinds of tactics that were also in response to the situation uh, that was happening at the time. The picture uh, at the top is a subcontracting worker who has a big ice cube with coins in it. It was very, very hot in Korea during the time of this campaign. And so as she's holding that, what they were saying in the banner is that her wages are slipping away with inflation. And as the ice cube melts, the coins are dropping to the ground. The second picture you see there on the bottom is they invited people to understand how just how low the wages were of these uh, women cleaners, these subcontracting workers, by inviting them to come and have lunch with this woman. And the public was appalled by what this woman could afford on her lunch. And, and the results then of, of the public awareness building of this uh, had very si significant changes in raising the minimum wage and even how the minimum wage was uh, determined. The fifth example uh, of why we need to be looking at our tactics is that tactics themselves teach participants and observers how they can engage in the world. So even the way we use our tactics can bring people to understand uh, their rights and how they can claim their rights. The example that I'm going to show you today is coming from South Africa from the Institute for Democracy in South Africa, IDASA, where they began to really build the capacity of grassroots communities to understand the budget system and to understand what government money was marked for their community and how they could track whether or not the money came and how it was used which made it very possible for them to understand not only their own personal budgets in a different way, but how they could also engage with their local government uh, institutions and their national government institutions in a different way. And this idea of uh, monitoring our government budgets has now become really quite uh, popular and used in many, many countries around the world. The last example that I want to share in terms of why it's important for us to think about our tactics is that tra tactics are the training systems for engaging participants and allies in our organization's work. This part is very important 
in how we're thinking about building leadership within our own organizations and building that capacity for people to really engage in what it is that we're trying to do and change in the world. And I wanted to bring an example to you today from our own organization, the Center for Victims of Torture, where we have wanted to build the capacity of peer-to-peer -peer counselors in order to be able to serve survivors of torture and war trauma in refugee camps and communities where they repatriate back into their home countries. And so this process of being able to train community people to do the kind of healing work that our organization does, not only engaged them in our mission, but also gave them skills to continue to use that uh, in their own communities, no matter where they might have returned to or where they move in the world, that that skill travels with them. So those are the six reasons why it's important for us to think about our new tactics. And now we want to take some time uh, to be able to move into what are the considerations that we need to make in order to be looking at our tactical choices. And these are very critical and particularly critical in uh, countries and in conditions where you may be facing significant uh, repression or opposition to the goals in which you are trying to uh, expand in terms of human rights. And so when we think about these important considerations, one of them is your group's capacity to actually carry out the tactic that you have identified. What kinds of resources do you need to have in place? Um, what aspects of your uh, group conditions do you need to know in order to respond to those? And that also entails this tolerance for risk. The picture that is there on the screen for you is of a, a demonstration that was then very violently uh, dispersed by police. And this particular context was in Serbia under the Milosevic uh, regime. And that aspect about tolerance for risk that those who uh, are willing to go out for a demonstration where that potential for a very serious uh, response and backlash from the government could be high takes a different kind of, of planning and a different kind of group of people who are interested and willing to put themselves in that kind of condition. And it's also for that reason that you want to have a wide variety of tactics that people can engage with with your organization. Because maybe younger people might be more interested and willing to be out on the street and protesting in this way, whereas those adults that might have family responsibilities, children or elderly people, might be very interested to also see the change you are working for, but they aren't able to uh, participate in that kind of a tactic, but they might be very interested to um, be involved in other ways as uh, support in the background or offering spaces for uh, meetings or uh, providing food or other kinds of monetary resources, a wide range of ways in which people can be engaged. Next is in terms of that analysis of the opponent, if you're going to be using a particular tactic, it's very critical to analyze what might be the responses of different uh, aspects of your uh, population of people. Uh, one of the tools that we uh, have on our New Tactics website that might be helpful and useful to you is a spectrum of allies that helps you to identify who are your active allies all the way to who are your allies active opponents, and thinking about where different groups and institutions might uh, decide to line up related to the kind of tactic that you would be implementing. And last, of course, all of these things have to be taken into consideration in terms of the context in which the tactic is going to be used. And in terms of the um, kind of the group, again, in which you are targeting. So tactics that are, are looking at uh, 
addressing a particular religious community or situation would need to be looking at how might that religious community respond to the kind of tactic that you're wanting to employ. Those sorts of things. So as we move then into talking today about our prevention tactics, I wanted to just uh, give this little illustration in terms of ideas for what's hitting your target. That we come back, back to that part about the person being right directly involved in the, the, your tactic target. It might be their closer community surrounding these people or a small group of people. It might be a larger segment or group of your society. Or it might be further away in terms of being in a, some kind of an institution that you're trying to reach. And that each of these kind of spaces in your target area uh, need different kinds of tactics to address them. Now as we move into um, the area of looking at our prevention tactics, I want to just uh, note that we're going to be sharing this a, a little bit beyond than the naming and shaming kind of tactics that are, are often quite prevalent here. And so the prevention tactics really are aiming to prevent imminent abuse. And we're going to be looking at the three categories. Uh, providing physical protection, sharing critical information, and removing opportunities for abuse. And we're going to launch a little poll again and ask you, how many of you have used one or more of these kinds of tactics? And you can uh, check as many as apply to your experience. So please uh, launch that poll for us. What we have is 47% of you and I, I should say hey, um, just a little less than 80% of you actually voted, and so you have about 20% um, that didn't come in and, and select any. But from about 80% of you, 47% uh, of you um, have used physical protection kinds of tactics. 63% of you have used sharing critical information tactics. And about 37% have used uh, tactics that remove opportunities for abuse. So great. I'm just really thrilled to, to see that kind of um, action related to prevention tactics. So as we move then in, into sharing some of uh, the protection uh, information and resources that I hope you will continue to explore after this webinar, um, we're going to look first at physical protection. And these are tactics that prevent harm through the actual physical presence of people. And so the example that I, I'm going to just share with you here is uh, from uh, Peace Brigades International. There are other organizations and groups that are also becoming very involved in providing actual physical protection and unarmed accompaniment in order to provide witness and be able to uh, be a bridge between communities or human rights activists that are threatened and the international community. And I just want to note that if you want to take a, a piece of paper to note down that this example can be found on page 31 in the English version of our New Tactics in Human Rights book. And I particularly want to highlight three online dialogues that we have conducted that I think will be very uh, much of interest to those of you that would like to explore uh, how we might implement physical protection tactics. And I'm going to show you um, not the unarmed accompaniment tactic, but the staying safe, um, security resources for human rights defenders. And we also I just want to highlight one that we've recently done, being well and staying safe. But I think this um, staying safe security resources uh, has some areas that I would like to point out to you. First of all, you'll, you'll note that um, each of our tactic dialogues have what we call featured resource practitioners. These are people who are in the field and are implementing these tactics. And so they are sharing what is going on in the field for being able to uh, advance these ideas and get new ideas for themselves, as well as open up those ideas to other people who are, are interested in exploring this tactic. 
And as you look at our, the screen, we provide a summary of the, the tactic that has occurred, or the dialogue that has occurred. And this gives you kind of an overview of what aspects were discussed. So um, who are human rights defenders and how do they need to, to have their security um, uh, protected? And what are some of the aspects that relate to um, information, communication, and technology that can also be part of that physical presence act aspect of physical protection? And ways in which um, human rights defenders can be conscious of protecting themselves. And that is a, a very significant uh, area to look at. I want to go next to sharing of critical information. And it was great that 63% of you have already been using tactics that share critical information. And these really relate to how are you um, sharing this critical information in order to put that information into the hands of people who can prevent the abuse. So as we look at this particular example, uh, I'm going to share one, uh, again, coming back to our technology of using mobile phones. But this was an example of how a communication network can be used in order to stop violence before it escalates. And this was an example that happened uh, from an organization, Interaction Belfast, that it can be found on page 35 of the New Tactics book, that shared how the uh, process between the violence between the Protestants and the Catholics were being overcome by the community members themselves by this use of a mobile phone network. And we did, did uh, also launch a tactical dialogue that was uh, really looking at ways in which mobile phones can be used for preventing abuse. And I encourage you to look at that. Um, and I want to also just, uh, well, actually, I think I, I won't share this particular dialogue, but I want to um, it point out that the inter information activism, turning information into act action, has some really great uh, resources for those of you who are interested to expand your sharing of critical information. The last area of prevention tactics that we're going to use is removing opportunities for abuse. Now, these are tactics that anticipate and create obstacles in order to stop abuses. <clears throat> now, the example that I want to share with you here comes from um, one of our colleague torture treatment program organizations in Nepal. And this particular example you can find on page 44 of our New Tactics book. But this was created as an alternative mechanism for dispute resolution. And the reason the Center for Victims of Torture in Nepal chose to implement this kind of tactic is that the level of abuse that takes place within police stations is so prevalent and so high that a victim may go to report a crime against them to the police station, and rather than getting aid uh, for their own issue that happened, the police might actually beat them into confessing to a different crime. And so it, people are victimized uh, many times over. And so the Center for Victims of Torture in Nepal decided that one way in which they could prevent uh, the torture of so many community people was to remove a wide variety of disputes that could be handled outside of a police station if there was a mechanism in which uh, that dispute could be addressed. And they found by instituting these um, committees uh, for resolution that they were able to highly reduce the number of complaints that went to the police station, which the police were actually very happy about. They were able to collect very good uh, information that if they were not able to resolve the issue at this community level, they actually were able to present that to the police and the courts. And it was accepted as a valid uh, investigation of an issue. 
So this became, has become uh, quite a prevalent way in which they have been able to prevent uh, quite a wide variety of abuses in their community. I wanted to bring you to our searchable tactics database with also an example of uh, prevention of abuse. And in terms of also building allies with government institutions, this particular case coming from the Visayan Forum in the Philippines, they built a cooperation with the Philippine Ports Authority, which is a governmental uh, authority, in order to intervene in the issue of human trafficking, where in the seaports, they were actually able to build this network to intercept uh, victims of trafficking before they boarded uh, vessels that then bore them outside of the country and made it possible to apprehend then those suspected traffickers. So I'm going to take you to this particular example in our website so you can also see how you might be able to use this searchable tactics database. So as you come in, you can take a look at um, how they're organized by the categories within our New Tactics and Human Rights book. If you are looking for the physical protection, uh, sharing of critical information, removing opportunities for abuse, but you can also uh, search in this tactic uh, database, and I will type in Philippines, and we'll have that apply, and I will show you how this actually comes up then for us so that you see those tactics that come directly from the Philippines or related to the Philippines. And as you can see, this building allies with government institutions and port communities is the first on our list. And as you click on that, it will take you to the space where you can read more about how they were able to actually implement this alliance and uh, the results that they were able to incur from this tactic. So as we come back then to our last of our slides, we have just a few more minutes left. And I want to uh, be sure to talk just a little bit about our upcoming webinar dates. Um, coming up in August, we'll be talking about intervention tactics. In um, the end of the 24th of August, we will specifically look at restorative tactics. And in September, the last one, the promotional tactics, how do we go about building human rights cultures and institutions?